I would like to share with the constituents and with you, these local uh, media opportunities are so important. When we think about how little news local that we have access to now, uh, you know, the, the large social media channels have decided that they're going to limit the amount of, of news that's going to come out, the amount of debate that can happen. I think that that's really, uh, it's really hard on democracy. We know that that negatively impacts democracy when people don't have access to information and they don't have access to local information. So I want to thank you mm -hmm. for the work you do and for the team to make sure that people do have access to local information about what's happening on the ground. And please keep it up. We need it so desperately. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Nancy Furness and this is We've Got Issues. We're filming on site today at Coquitlam City Centre Library and we'd like to thank the library for giving us this venue to film our interviews. Before we get started, I'd like to also acknowledge that our, film, that our interviews are taking place on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So today we're joined by Benita Zarilla, who is the MP for Port Moody Coquitlam. So thanks so much for joining us today, Benita. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you so much for hosting this, uh, this, this type of program that keeps people connected to their local community. So, Benita, you have been a three-term city councillor for Coquitlam, yep. and now you're Member of Parliament for Port Moody, Coquitlam, Belcara, and Anne Moore. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about why you made that big leap from municipal-level politics to federal-level politics? Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for, for asking that question because it is, you know, it is very different. Uh, mm -hmm. It is very different work that we do at the federal level compared to what happens at the municipal level. And uh, I think when I saw we had a very, very good MP for a long time, Finn Donnelly, who's now the MLA for Coquitlam Burke Mountain, mm -hmm. we had a very strong uh, federal representative in regards to environment, mm -hmm. in, in regards to housing. And when that position came open, I felt there was a very... Um, important work that still needed to be done on the environment and on housing. Mm -hmm. And I did have the experience from municipal politics on housing and the environment. And it was just a, an opportunity to make sure that that continuity continued and that the, the residents of Coquitlam, Port Moody, Anmore, and, 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 and Belcara continued to be well served with someone that had the experience and the knowledge of the community. And, you know, I think we have heard from you. We've heard your voice. Um, so your constituents are hearing you speak out. You are with the NDP um, and you have 24 seats out of 235. So there's a liberal minority um, in power right now. Yeah. How do you make sure that your voice is heard both, you know, in, in the community as well as in Parliament? Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for asking that because, you know, it is true. It's, it's a small group. The NDP is a smaller group. There's 224 of us. But this has been the most productive uh, minority parliament since Tommy Douglas's day when the Canadians got health care. So I think about what we've managed to achieve in those 25, now 24 uh, seats because Daniel Blakely, uh, MP Daniel Blakey went to work with the Manitoba government. So there is a by-election coming up. There's actually two seats available oh. in Canada right now. There's a seat in Montreal and a seat in uh, Winnipeg that's running. But the, uh, the, the opportunity for us as a small team mm -hmm. to be able to collaborate with the government has brought res results for Canadians and for in regards to dental care, the largest expansion to health care in 50 years, pharmacare, which we know many, many people in our community uh, are, in, are in need of. The, it's very expensive to live in Vancouver. We all know that. It's very expensive to live in Metro Vancouver. So these are the type of things that alleviate some of those costs of living. And then you were asking me personally on me, on my voice, I just bring the issues that come from the community. Mm -hmm. I, I make sure that I stay focused on the things that I'm hearing out in the community and the things that matter to people here. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll go into a little bit more depth on that in a bit. But yes, I have seen your your um, your 
videos and also heard your voice here. So definitely you are being heard yes. in the community. Mm -hmm. um, you're being kept really busy <laughs> in Ottawa. You have uh, multiple roles that you're filling. And I just want to talk a little bit about some of those because I think it might be of interest to see the, the range of stuff that you're involved with. One of them is you're the NDP's critic for infrastructure and communities. That's Can right. you explain a little bit about that and maybe about some things that NDP would like to see happen or, or done differently? For sure. Well, infrastructure and communities is what's interesting when you think about the infrastructure and community file, and I am the NDP critic for infrastructure and community, housing didn't fold under infrastructure and communities. Infrastructure and communities talked about water, it talked about bridges, okay. it talked about highways, it talked about um, the uh, 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 environmental uh, protections and retrofits and those sort of things, but it didn't talk about housing. So that was recently changed. The government came forward and joined both the housing ministry oh. and the infrastructure and uh, communities ministry together. So the uh, infrastructure and communities ministry and minister uh, very rarely bring bills to the house. It's, Why is uh, that? You know, it's, well, it's interesting. They Mostly it's about spending. Mostly oh, okay. that portfolio right. is about spending and working with communities, rural and urban, on the ground. So it's how, where that money goes, what the priority that's is, right. how to, okay. Yeah, that's right. Mm. And I think the, one of the things that I hear from the community that's difficult in, in the infrastructure community profile is the transparency around how those funds are allocated. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm working on all the time. I say right now it's a lottery. Uh, cities like Coquitlam or Port Moody wouldn't know if they're getting funding when they ask for certain projects. So we're looking at some transparency around that. Okay, so that's interesting. So to increase the transparency around that file and to, so that people can see where the, the funds are going and maybe why they're being al allocated in a certain way? Yeah, absolutely. We'd like that, like more visibility into what are the mm. criteria, what are the, the criteria that the government looks at to allocate that funding. But also it's important for our mayors and council councillors to know, right. you know, what is my probability of securing this funding? Because they want to do long-term planning. They need to know, do I need a plan B? Am I likely going to get this funding? All of that matters that to makes them. makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to have that information in order to make a plan that's going to work going forward. Mm, okay. And Nancy, can I just mention on um, Indigenous infrastructure, mm -hmm. this is this lack of transparency and almost short term planning that the government uh, brings forward is very difficult for Indigenous communities because they get funded year by year by year. They can't even make a five to 10 year plan. So I meet with uh, leaders in the Indigenous community that say, you know, this isn't working right. for long term planning at all the way it's being handled right now. Okay, so you've just brought up reconciliation and, and that sort of issue. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Are we doing enough for reconciliation? I know the, um, the Liberal government has done some things. Is there more that you think we should be doing? Yes, thank you for raising that. And there is a lot to do. We have a very strong Indigenous caucus for the federal NDP. Uh, Blake Desjardins is Métis from, uh, from Edmonton. Uh, Lori uh, Idlut from mm -hmm. Nunavut, she's uh, the member of parliament from Nunavut. She's done incredible work to uh, to move, uh, raise the issues that are that are reality in Nunavut. The housing is very, very so representation stretched. is important to have, like in parliament. Exactly, absolutely. And I think about uh, Leah Gazan, who is the she's um, First Nations woman in Winnipeg, and she brought forward the redress alert. Oh, right. She worked with community to advance the red dress alert, which would not have happened without the representation of an Indigenous mm -hmm. woman in, in Parliament. Some really good work going on there and still, as you say, more to be done, right? I think one of the things that you have spoken up for always, as long as I've known you, is equality. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in Ottawa to promote equality? I know that you are... Um, you have a role in the disability inclusion and also deputy health critic. What what's happening on those fronts? Yeah, well, there, you know, it's a it's coming along faster. I think about when I first started, uh, when I first got elected in 2013, and there was a big conversation about having a rainbow crosswalk in Coquitlam. Yes, you know, it took a yes. it took a long time to make that happen, and now, uh, fortunately, and 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 thanks to the 
the representation there has been in government, we're moving along many of those equity uh, issues. So I would definitely say that uh, we've come a long way in the 11 years that I've been elected. One of the areas I, obviously women, mm -hmm. is when I first got elected, I came from business and I went into elected uh, politics and I couldn't, I actually couldn't believe how little protections there were for, oh, really? yes, for equity seeking groups in government. Mm. And certainly within elected officials, there is no, there is no protection. There is no HR department. Uh, it's all, uh, you know, you're, so on, you're your on your own. own. You're on your own. You're on your own when you get in there. That's a little bit disturbing to hear that there's no protections around. I think um, also at the municipal level, we, we see the same issue. So I didn't realize it went right up to federal as well. Well, it's, a, it's absolutely the same. Absolutely. Elected officials, you know, they have to monitor their own behavior. So they're self, basically. self yeah. policing. Yeah. Kind of. And we can see that's not necessarily working. If we yes. look at what's happening out on social media right now, yes. um, you know, many elected officials are happy to go on and incite all kinds of unrest on social media, which is really unfortunate. And on the same time, many elected officials are being targeted. Right. by their own colleagues on social media. So it's it's, it's really sad to see that happen. Yeah. Um, is there something that we can do about that? Is there a way to change that? Is there um, some oversight that could be potentially brought in to address that or an ombudsperson or something? Yeah, I think it's difficult. It's difficult because it's really, it's always in, you know, it's in the perception of mm -hmm. those who are evaluating. So I think our best our best movement is we, we stay focused on community, we support community, we model the best kind of behavior that we can. And, you know, I think that it's time right now, community is coming together after four long years right. of COVID. Right, um, which represented a whole other realm of issues, right, yeah, and challenges. And, yeah, and, and, and isolating people and limiting people's access to, to getting together and gathering as community. So I think that's work that elected officials can do is to make sure that they're supporting community in any way they can mm -hmm. for community to come together, for isolation to end, for any opportunities to connect people to their community and the resources within. Right. Now, we've just been talking about um, women and equality and equity and, and things. Uh, the Conservative Party have said that you, you have called them dangerous to women. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that? How are they dangerous? What danger do they pose to women? Yeah, sure. Well, this kind of is in a carry on to the conversation we were just mm -hmm. having about, yes. about rights, about equality and about human rights in Canada, the charter rights of every Canadian in Canada. And, you know, enforcement of those charter rights is very, very difficult. Um, for someone who's had their charter rights uh, infringed upon, mm -hmm. Uh, for them to have to take the steps to fight for themselves, it's not right. So I think about women right now. We know that the the conversation about access to abortions and abortions, it's yes. health care. Yes. Women are entitled to that access. and it's We've fought a long battle to get to where we are. Exactly, yeah. and we can't be going back in time. Mm -hmm. And we know that the Conservatives and the House of Common have, Commons have tried on many occasions to reopen the debate on whether or not um, abortions should be a right, a health care right for women. And uh, of course, as the NDP, we believe that, of course, uh, abortions are the decision of women. Everyone has access and a right to that. And that that also should be accessible. And that's what we're seeing happening in provinces across this country conservative provinces, they're rolling back access so to abortion. We're seeing differences amongst the provinces with respect to access to health care for women? Absolutely, because health care, although we have Health Canada Act, health care is administered on the provincial and territorial oh, okay. level. So the province can decide mm -hmm. uh, if there's going to be access or not access. And again, I'm going to do a, a call out to my uh, colleague Leah Gazan in Winnipeg, who who is constantly calling out in the House of Commons this lack of access for women, wow. and we think about how that really does infringe on the charter rights of women in this country. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. Right? Um, so you are also a member of the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills and social development, and also the status of persons with disabilities. You've got your plate is really full. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Does it sort of extend um, from what you've 
been speaking about already. Tell us a little bit about your role and what you do there. Absolutely. Then. So the parliamentary committees are really the space where where policy recommendations are and can be made, and then it's mm -hmm. up to the government to pick those up. So on human resources and skills development in persons with disabilities, it is a very wide uh, it's a huge uh, portfolio. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the first things when I was elected, well, it was the first that report that came out of there. We did a report on the care economy, labor shortages in the care economy. Oh, okay. And I recently came up against that with my own, within my own family. Oh, tell so, me about that a little bit. Yeah, so I had my mom staying with me during COVID because I didn't want her to be isolated and it was really difficult to get access and navigate the whole system to try and get help and, and care that she needed. So um, I was kind of a little bit surprised at the gaps and at how difficult it is. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything that you can add to that, that well absolutely so that was our first study that we talked about you know we have an aging population mm -hmm. and we need to get uh we need to get a plan together we need to get uh um the resources available well, and also value the people that are giving those resources right a hundred percent a hundred percent and i think that's what we found out during this study was to value those workers mm -hmm. and we don't even collect data you know, so many other industries, if you think about real estate, if we think about construction, and business, if, we, yes. if we think about business, if we think about resource extraction, they carry, they, the government gathers much data and they learn from it and they put policy together around that. Right. When it came to the care economy and those workers, majority women. Yes, absolutely. Um, they don't even collect data on it. So wow. I think there is a lot of room to do to uh, shine a light on the importance of that mm. work. Almost 30% of the GDP in Canada is supported by those workers. You know, and that goes back to equity and equality and all the things that we've been talking about before that you've been involved in. So there's a lot of interconnections there. there. Is. there is. And Benita, I'm sorry, you brought up resource extraction. Yes. <laughs> so I have to um, go there a little bit. Yes. So in 2018, um, the federal Liberal government purchased a pipeline on behalf of Canadians for $4.7 billion. Can you tell me, was that a good deal for Canadians? Well, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I think the fact that the Canadian government bought it was just, mm -hmm. it was shocking to many. Uh, I know when I first started uh, in municipal politics, I mean, we have the Kinder Mor or Trans Mountain expansion, mm -hmm. the Trans Mountain Pipeline, I've been the Trans Mountain expansion, but the Trans Mountain Pipeline is, goes through Coquitlam. Yes, right it now, does. Right? <laughs> so uh, I, was the, I, I brought a, a motion to the floor almost immediately after I was elected that we should have intervener status in the expansion of that pipeline because it affects residents here. Right, it's equipment. running through our backyards. Exactly, but I think about the billions of dollars and the overage, the yes. billions it of dollars of overage. It wasn't 4.7 billion that it ended up costing, right? It was coming 30, approaching over 30, 30 yes. billion dollars. And all of that money could have gone into what we just talked about, mm -hmm. health care, in about caring for each other, in other, uh, you know, could have been more research and development funds that could have come. come, come. We have a very strong hydrogen, um, Mm -hmm. uh, cohort in BC, we we could be exploring many many other options. So looking at some green energy or greener energy. Absolutely, options. some transitions. And the federal government chose to buy this pipeline, which is a, a terrible decision. And I think that uh, Kinder Morgan themselves, they made a good decision. They were because they happy knew to walk away. Yeah, I think they yes. knew. Yeah. And what I find also disappointing is is that that the head of Kinder Morgan continued to have their job, yes. c came under the government and continues to live the lifestyle that uh, they've all, that, that that person has always lived. And it's, it's quite unbelievable. It's it, quite unbelievable that, that a private company downloaded to the government knowing they were going in it the negative. It opens a lot of issues and a lot of questions. And I think we could have a whole conversation around that as well. We could. Um, you know, the pipeline was recently um, opened up for operation, yeah. the green light was given. Do you think that green light was given with adequate safety measures in place? Um, are we at risk in any way of that pipeline um, running through and all that's associated with it? Yeah, well, let's go back to our conversation about transparency. Who really knows the answer to that question? Because they, the transparency is not there. I've mm -hmm. tried to have a visit here uh, uh, in Coquitlam and I've been limited of my really? ability to have access. What I would say is that, you know, the, the pipeline, many workers worked on the pipeline. We yes. want to make sure that we have 
transition work for workers and what's happening now. I think that's now, crucial, it's right? It's crucial that we yeah. have a transition for workers. Right now, now that the pipeline is done, there's very few workers mm -hmm. that are working mm -hmm. now on the pipeline. It has a very... Sort of this whole boom and bust exactly. kind of uh, scenario, yeah, right? It's so not sustainable now what do we work. Do? Yeah. 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 So we do need to find, and I mean, the, MB, the NDP, I mean, the Conservatives fought us all the way on, uh, on, a, on a jobs plan, on a, on, on a bill that was going to look at having a planning table of how do we look at the uh, workers for the future? What are the, what are the opportunities for oil and gas workers for the, the future? And the Conservatives fought us all the way on that. They fought filibustered all the way. that oh. committee forever. It was a very, very difficult fight with the Conservatives who still want to live in the 1980s, mm. the 1990s. And in fact, they want to bring back policies, not just on energy, but on women, women's right. rights. They're yeah, looking yeah. to roll back the clock and we got to make sure they don't do that. That's interesting. There's a, a lot of work <laughs> to be done in Ottawa all around. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what your biggest achievement is or what you're most proud of? Like, uh, you know, understanding that you've done so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's a team, right? Mm -hmm. It's the NDP. And as I was saying, this is the uh, most successful uh, government since Tommy Douglas. Right. The NDP as a team managed to uh, push the Liberals to advance dental care, the largest expansion. We have uh, thousands and thousands of kids and seniors in our community alone, Nancy, who have uh, been able to go to the dentist after years and years and years of no access. So we have the dental care program. We have the pharmacare bill mm -hmm. that's already there where we have. So uh, people aren't necessarily having to choose between paying the rent or paying the electricity or buying their medication. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that is a real that is a real choice. Many seniors I know are taking half of their pills because they can't rationing them out. Exactly. Yeah. No. And we look also to uh, some of the job action that's been happening, which is great. Workers have stood up and say, hey, we you know, we want uh, we want to have good working conditions and benefits. I was out on a picket line recently and some of the workers were, were also having to cut their pills uh, in half because when you're on the picket lines, you're, you know, you're not getting your full That's salary, yes. but they're willing to be there for the next generation. They want the next generation of workers, these young workers to have the access to good, mm -hmm. good paying jobs with benefits. Yeah. And Nancy, I'm going to take a minute just on the on the also the other thing that our that the NDP pushed the government to do mm -hmm. was the the child care, the ten dollar yes, the ten dollar a day child care. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, I always say I'm in this chair because of five dollar a day daycare. Both of my kids, I lived in Montreal and I got the five dollar a day daycare, and it allowed me to do many things I couldn't have done without affordable well, child care. I recall those days we paid a lot for child care back in the day. And I remember going a little bit into debt at the end of every month and just like it was so stressful, um, but there were really no options. That's right. right? That's so right. tell us about Well, that's the, a choice, right? That here. too many families have to mm -hmm. make, whereas like one, house, one person potentially has to stay home or can I have another child because daycare is so expensive. So we know that this, this is now a national program. Almost all of the provinces are on side. You know, again, the conservative prov provinces have been difficult to get on side. Um, they don't necessarily uh, believe in a national program where every woman should have a choice and every family should have a choice on whether or not they want to have access to daycare or want to use the daycare that's accessible to them. And we believe in public daycare, quality public daycare right. that's affordable for everyone. So it's here and we will see the results. We know that the uh, p participation in the workforce in, in, in Quebec is, is high and we know that that will happen here, that people will not have to make that decision like you said, you know, I have to go in debt. What, what other things do I have to cut this month? And you know, even as a city council, I can remember when I was first elected, um, meeting folks on Burke Mountain and them saying, you know, it's the second largest payment after my mortgage Oh, payment. it definitely, it was for, I can vouch for that. <laughs> But yeah, so I think women everywhere will be thanking you for that because it is extremely stressful situation not having the funds and, and you want good quality child care. Exactly. Right? Um, can you talk about what's one more thing yes, that for you sure. want to see done before the end of the term? Because I know you've got a yes. lot of um, things on the go, but what's the one thing that you yeah. want to see well, let's talk about disability because we haven't really mm -hmm. talked about it yet. When, uh, when I was a city councillor, I had the disability file and it really was uh, so important for equity and so important to talking about infrastructure and communities to have accessible cities. And we know, I, I know I've got some uh, 
the, some folks in the disability community who said that they're going to be going to New York right away. Very difficult to navigate New oh. York, their, their oh, older yes. infrastructure. And then also I was with someone on Friday. We were actually looking at robots for persons oh, uh, in wheelchairs where they would have robots. That's a Canadian so company. What would the robots do? It, it's like a, an attachment that's a, a ability to, um, if you don't want to be in your in the chair, that you would be able to get into a ectoskeletal robot and be able oh, to Oh, wow, that opens navigate. up a whole new world. Absolutely. So wow. that's in the early stages. But I was there with, uh, with a, a Paralympian, and the Paralympian was on their way to uh, Paris, and they were saying that, again, older infrastructure, old city, very difficult to navigate in wheelchairs. Right. So the disability uh, file and the need for equity and accessibility mm -hmm. has always been important to me. So I want to go to the Canada Disability Benefit. So the Canada Disability Benefit is an income support uh, benefit for, though, for people with disabilities living in poverty. And the Liberals promised it, but didn't bring it to the so table. So we have no benefit there right now? There is or? benefits, but there's not necessarily income benefits for persons of working age that okay. are federal. It's provincial right now, the oh, provincial okay. government. So, uh, so that's some of th that is one of the achievements mm -hmm. I'm very pleased about was be able to get the Liberals to bring forward that promise and to make it happen. It's now law. There is a Canada disability benefit. So my, my hope and what I really want to see is by this time next year, Nancy, that that program will be implemented. And when I say that program is implemented, that people are receiving checks, mm -hmm. that we know that people in, with disabilities living in the deepest poverty have that extra, um, that extra income that they need. And at the same time, the, the provinces do need to step up. They need to step up on increased on housing benefit for persons with disabilities mm -hmm. and, and income supports for persons with disabilities. But this, this federal one, it's, uh, it's again uh, something that's deeply needed in our communities. We see poverty everywhere. We know that, Nancy, we're minutes away from the homeless shelter in Coquitlam. Yes. We know many people We've heard in lots the shelter about that, lately. Yeah, yes. that have a uh, disability that needs support that aren't getting the supports they need. So yeah, the Canada Disability Benefit being in people's bank accounts is one of the things I really look forward to next year. Wow, that's exciting to see if we could see something like that because it lifts us all up, right? Yes, so exactly. um, it sounds like there's lots to do on the federal as well as provincial there and is. perhaps municipal as well to And I think Nancy, that's in. something to think about and to talk about here is you know, when I first started in city council it was like, Okay, this isn't mm. this is municipal jurisdiction, we're not you know, we're not gonna weigh into that. Right. This is provincial, we're not gonna weigh into that. This is federal, we're not gonna weigh into that. Well, that just isn't the way anymore. Everyone needs to be working together to solve the problems in community. Well, and what's interesting is you take that perspective to Ottawa with you. You've worked at the municipal level, so you've seen that sort of, you know, not my territory kind of pushing things back. So it's something that you're maybe more aware of than some others who have jumped straight into, you know, federal level politics. So um, it's nice to have that broader perspective. For sure. And I mean, I saw displacement. I mm -hmm. saw displacement. I saw gentrification. I saw how, uh, you know, affordable housing was being taken away from people. Yes. I saw it firsthand. I see the impact and I see how wrong it is not to be planning and to be working together. Yeah. Is there anything else, any last words you would like to share with your constituents or anything you'd like to share with us? Well, I would like to share with the constituents and with you, these local uh, media opportunities are so important. When we think about how little news local that we have access to now, uh, you know, the the large social media channels have decided that they're going to limit the amount of, of news that's going to come out, the amount of debate that can happen. I think that that's really, uh, it's really hard on democracy. We know that that negatively impacts democracy when people don't have access to information and they don't have access to local information. So I want to thank you mm -hmm. for the work you do and for the team to make sure that people do have access to local information about what's happening on the ground. And please keep it up. We need it so desperately. Well, thank you so much for those words of support and encouragement because I think everybody at Tri-Cities Community TV feels the same way. Um, there's so much information, so many stories out there that um, aren't being covered and it's a really, you know, a gap that we, we try to fill. And so we really appreciate your support on that. So well, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us this afternoon, Benita. Thank you. <laughs> We've been speaking this afternoon with 
a member of parliament, Benita Zarillo. She's a member of parliament for Port Moody, Coquitlam. And thank you so much for joining us.